nice to be back in Aspen and uh, continue my work to convert all C++ programmers to Haskell. Uh, I wonder how many people here have at least a little bit of experience with Haskell? Wow! Nice, okay. Because I'll, I'll be... Yeah, I, I won't be really introducing Haskell step by step, just a little bit, so that the, the people who don't know Haskell can catch up a little bit. Okay, so the, the, the topic of this talk with Eric Niebler here is about compile time, runtime, functional programming in C++. Okay, compile time C++ is really a functional thing. If you go into programming templates, you quickly realize that this is purely functional language. Whereas runtime C++ is as imperative as you can get. So, so these are two very, very different worlds. And then there is this area in between these two worlds that, that is of utmost interest to me. And here's the lay of the land. The upper part is compile time C++. The lower part, really not that important, is the runtime C++. And this is the area of runtime compile time uh, calculations that are actually the most useful ones. Okay? And I also divided it sort of in these columns corresponding to different aspects of uh, functional programming, because we are starting from the top. So, so functional programming deals with functional data structures with functions, and eventually at some point you get to monads and <coughs> you discover a completely new world. So let's, let's start with um, data structure. You have uh, uh, most functional languages, well, all, all functional languages, I guess, have these algebraic data structures, which is a way of combining primitive data structures into more uh, extensive data structures. And uh, they usually use pattern matching for like, unpacking these data structures, right? Um, then probably the most useful data structure or most used data structure in functional programming is a list, right? It's not that you cannot use anything else other than lists, you can, but if you want to quickly write a program and quickly convince yourself that it's correct, you usually start with lists. You implement your algorithms using, using lists and you test them and, and convince yourself that it's correct, and then at some point you can just plug in arrays, okay? Because you already know that your algorithm is <coughs> Uh, correct. Right? So, um, well, Boost MPL is this big library that actually uses functional programming uh, at compile time. And it has its data structures, it has sequences, uh, forward sequence is probably something that's closest to a list. Right? Um, now, uh, C11 introduced. Uh, variadic templates and uh, variadic templates sort of looks like look like lists and you can use them like lists so this is something that I've been exploring a little bit how can how we can program using variadic templates as lists in the functional sense um, there is uh, pattern matching and you can do pattern matching on, on these uh, variadic lists, or you can use pattern matching on any data structures. Proto, for instance, has these constructs like proto or that are actually doing pattern matching. Uh, for, for people who don't know, <coughs> proto is a, a boost library uh, for uh, building domain specific embedded languages. Yes. Um, so, so lists in um, functional programming 
are both algebraic data structures and recursive data structures. So recursion is another part that's very important in functional programming. Because a list is defined as the head of the list and the rest, which the rest is also a list. So that's a sort of, a list is eating its own tail. Um, then you have functions, and the most important thing in functional programming is that functions are uh, first-class citizens. Okay, so which means that you can have functions passed around, like like any other data types. You can have functions that take functions as arguments, they return functions as arguments. And usually, these functions are called higher-order functions because they operate on functions, right? Boost MPL has lots of this stuff. Uh, th here there are examples of some of the uh, higher order algorithms uh, that operate on lists. Fold is one example, and I think MPL has something. Is it called Fold? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and there are maps, and surely MPL has maps as well. Um, so, <coughs> that, yeah? yes? Well, so, you know, what you'd like the distinguishing characteristic of a map is it should be better than linear in terms of lookup. And we thought we were doing that, but we think we were mistaken. Yeah. <laughs> so, um. Okay, so actually Eric will be talking about performance, uh, compile time. Because we are talking compile time performance. Yeah. Right? Which sort of should happen once and it should be over and, and then users are interested in runtime performance. But compile time performance is also very important. Um, so my uh, idea was how, how can, we, can we actually implement these higher order um, algorithms at compile time using variadic templates as lists? Okay, and I did a little bit of fiddling around and the answer is yes and no. Okay, so it's very definite. <laughs> um, then, then uh, sort of uh, monads are, are a way of combining these higher order functions, right? So, so once you abstracted stuff and you're saying, okay, I'm I'm gonna work with higher order functions to hide the details of implementation, then you would like to combine these these higher order functions in sort of like passing arguments from one higher order function to another higher order function and so on, but hiding the details, okay? So, um, so there are these compile time monads that um, Abel and uh, Zoltan will be talking about, right? So I leave, the, leave it to them. Uh, uh, I'll be talking about the uh, continuation mode. Actually, I won't be talking much about it as the compile time monad, I'll just explain how it could be used to fix the problem with, with variadics. Uh, but I won't go into much detail. Yes? I'm sorry, are you talking about the implementation of these monads in C++? Or compile time C++. Yes. <coughs> um, so once I got into this continuation model, I, I, I got interested in, okay, so um, I started thinking about it so much that I finally decided, okay, I'm going to go with this and see um, if I can move the continuation model into the gray area, which is the most interesting part. So how can you use a continuation model at compile time to produce some interesting code that will then run the runtime, okay? And, and then I thought about, okay, what applications would that have? And, and then uh, I learned a few months ago uh, about what C Sharp is doing with asynchronous functions. And this is exactly what continuations do. So this is actually a theoretical framework behind what the C Sharp guys are doing. And I know that C Sharp guys are very smart and they understand functional programming. So I'm sure they actually understand how to use monads. And, and this is why 
at least in my opinion, C sharp is a much cleaner language than C++. It has the theoretical foundations which C++ is often missing. So I will talk about the continuation Mona uh, runtime compile time and give you an example of code that actually works. Well, it's a uh, toy example, but still it works and, and uh, it does asynchronous kind of activity using the continuation Mona. I'm not saying that this is a practical thing that you should be programming like this, probably not. But if the committee decides to actually go ahead with uh, uh, in implementing what C-Sharp guys implement um, as far as asynchronous interfaces go, then this would be a way of a proof of concept and also a way of uh, having theoretical foundations for what they are doing. So there is more stuff in this gray area. Variadic tuples is is something that Eric will be talking about. So this is in the area of data structures. But these are data structures that have both a compile time component and a runtime component, in the sense that during compile time, you just give it a bunch of types, and it will generate something that then at runtime will represent, represent a, a tuple that can actually be uh, modified and used to store um, some values, right? So this is why I'm putting it into this area of hybrid compile time runtime. <clears throat> then there are expression templates, which are algebraic data types, um, and um, they have this. They, they are on the boundary between compile time and runtime again, because what they do is. Uh, Using operator overloading, the runtime thing, right? You, you write an expression with some operators, but you apply these operators to not numbers, but some weird data structures that, that you introduce, like you know, arrays, vectors, or something like that, <coughs> or placeholders. And, and what the compiler does is it looks up operator overloading, so it has it. At its disposal and find some some operator overload that you provided, figures out the data types. So it essentially takes the whole expression with the operator overloading and creates a tree of types. It creates one type for the whole expression, but this one type is defined as a tree of other types. So you have templates that have take types as templates, and these types that it takes actually are templates that take other types, and so on. So you get a tree, and what happens is that at, the, at compile time, you can manipulate this tree and produce code that will evaluate this expression at runtime. So there's like a back and forth curve. You start with the runtime expression, you create a type-based representation of it, which is totally a functional thing, and then you create code that can be run in the runtime, and do things like evaluate the expression. That's probably what you are really interested in. Um, and this, this thing was taken to the extreme by Eric in his proto, where he actually uses sort of uh, expression templates on steroids. And, and there's one, and I sort of dedicated my life to understanding Eric's work. <laughs> <laughs> so every year I come up with another explanation of what he did. Um, last year I did the Proto Lambda, and I found he out... He understands it better than I do now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I introduced the state monad, and I understood it in terms of state monad. And I thought state monad is just called proto, but Eric said, no, no, no. There's much more to proto than just proto lambda. So this year I, I, I took upon myself to understand proto transforms. And it turns out that proto transforms are not monads, so mm, a little bit easier to understand. Uh, they are just these higher order functions. Okay, there's 
functions that operate on <coughs> compile time trees and runtime trees at the same time. Okay, so this is the plan. So a lot of stuff I probably won't have time to talk about that. So let me start with the introduction, gentle introduction. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some code because reading templates in C++ is really, really hard. So that's why I'm going to introduce the same code in Haskell and show you. <laughs> Haskell is extremely easy. You see examples. I mean, if you want to really understand C++ templates, you have to have a pseudo language for it. <laughs> and Eric was, he did a very good work explaining Proto in his blog, was it two years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and he used some kind of pseudo language, which was a little bit easier to understand the templates, but not much. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I translated the stuff into Haskell and suddenly it became, well, oh, it's, it's obvious, right? <laughs> So here's, here's the first thing. Uh, so in functional programming, you define functions, right? What is a function in compile time C++? Okay, so here's, here's Haskell code, and here's C++ code. <laughs> so you define functions uh, in, in, in Haskell by pattern matching, often. Not, not often, but, but a lot of this is pattern matching. So you have uh, you define a function is zero, and you say if you can pattern match, this is a very simple pattern, it just says zero. So if you call me with zero, right, uh, then return two. And actually, in Haskell, these things, uh, uh, you define functions using equations. So it's just like you can substitute this with this. You know. um, because they don't have any side effects. Like in C++, you can't really use it because you get side effects. Um, and otherwise, so the, the, the patterns are matched in order. So if you match it with zero, you just return true. If you can't match it with zero, you go to the next pattern that defines the function, which is x arbitrary value that's non-zero, so you return false. Okay, so that's a very simple implementation of a function. You might have problems with the syntax because there are no parentheses when you call functions in Haskell. But there's a very good reason for that. <coughs> so here's the same code in C++ except that it's inverted. Because like here you are pattern matching in order. Uh, in C++ pattern matching is done. Which one is the best fit? This one is taken. The, the specialization that fits best the argument. So, so general case goes first, which said, oh, okay, this is a slightly different function because I want to operate on types at compile time. So this is a function that takes a type t and returns a boolean. That's how you interpret this. And the function is called is pointer. Is this type a pointer? And the general case is no, it's not. So it returns false. Okay? The red uh, type is strictly Haskell, right? The white type is C++ mode. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the more specialized pattern which, we, which will kick in if it can. So if, if you call it with something that matches the pattern U star where U is an arbitrary thing, arbitrary type, then this one will kick in. And this one says, yeah, return true. And by return in C++ compile time, you mean it's a struct that has a data field. Uh, but this, is, this has to be a, a data field that can be initialized at compile time, not at runtime. So the only things that you can initialize at compile time are static constant values. So this is why it's static const equals false. Because you can do it at compile time. Right? So it's like a global variable that can be initialized 
have uh, combined. So this is what functions that are sometimes called meta functions in uh, compile time C++. <laughs> so now let's jump to variadic templates. And variadic templates, my interpretation of variadic templates that these are lists. Okay, so let's see how you can work on lists, first in Haskell and then in C++, using variadic templates. This is not the usual way you work with lists in compile time C++, right? You, you probably use type lists and stuff like this. But this is an, an attempt of using variadic templates for the same purpose. So here's the function count in Haskell which uh, counts the number of elements uh, in a list, right? And again, you do pattern matching. So if the argument matches empty list, this is empty list. Just two braces, uh, two brackets. Uh, then you return zero. It's an empty list, so count is zero. But if it's not empty, then, then you try match the second <coughs> pattern, which says, okay, lists are consists of a head and a tail, a tail being another list, possibly n, right? So if you match this pattern and, and then you say, okay, so if I match this pattern, pattern, then I know what the length of the list is, right? It's one for the head plus whatever is in the tail. So you get nicely re recursive algorithm to calculate the length of, of the, yeah, the length of the list. Right. And uh, um, lists go very nicely with recursion. And, and the same thing is in C++ uh, compile time. You, you can't have things like loops, right? But you can have recursion. So th this thing is directly translatable into a C++ compile time <coughs> algorithm. You're not being very fair to Haskell there. You Put a lot of C++ modes in, in uh, red on the bottom part. All the dot dot dots, the echo brackets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and columns. Aren't you a pure? That's okay. I mean, yeah. what do you do C++ anywhere? <laughs> sort of there is a meaning for these little things, maybe, in some sense. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Okay. <laughs> okay, so so first we start, in C++ we have to start with a um, declaration. And because afterwards we have two different specializations. So before you have a specialization in C++, you have to have a declaration. Right? Is that true? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. You have to see a primary template. Right, so, so this, is, this is the declaration. It says, okay, list, that's my argument, compile time is a variadic template. <coughs> variadic pack. Right? Um, Good question. Uh, are people familiar with the variadic uh, syntax with the dot dot dots? Okay. Whoever's familiar, raise your hand. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, almost everyone. Good. Yes, why don't I just explain? Um, so so this is so you, you read it in a Haskell way, count, count is a function that takes a list. Um, well, it doesn't say what it returns. But you'll see what it returns from, from the implementation, right? Um, so, uh, so this is the first case, empty, right? So you call your template with no arguments. The variadic argument means zero, one, two, three, four, and so on, types, as many as you want, including zero. So you can call this template, call, by call I mean instantiate, right? So you can instantiate this template with no argument, and in this case it will, it will return zero, right? Static const in value zero. So that means returning the length of the list is zero. Um, and you have a second specialization in which you actually do pattern matching in C++ very nicely. So you can pattern match a variadic <coughs> with head and tail, which is a, an 
now everybody will be happy. Right? So that very nicely corresponds to Haskell. Uh, and in that case, it returns what? One plus a recursively call the same in, or instantiate the same thing, template, but with the tail. So since, since you are recursively instantiating with shorter and shorter lists, eventually you will get to the first case, which will return zero, and you have counted all the elements of the list. So that's nice. This is how you use it. So this is a function call, uh, a compile time function call. So you instantiate count, let's say, with three arguments, which are types in this case. Right? And you put column, column value to get this guy. And it's an integer. And you can then use this integer at runtime if you want. So there's this bridge to runtime. OK, so now higher order functions. Uh, functions that operate on functions. So this is an example of a higher order function in, in Haskell. Um, it's called all. It takes a predicate, which is a function. That's why it's a higher order function. It takes a function. A predicate means it returns a Boolean value. Right? And uh, it just checks whether all elements in the list fulfill this predicate. All of them <coughs> actually satisfy this predicate. And again, the, 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 defini the, the definition is. is uh, using pattern matching, for an empty list, the, we return true. Any predicate is true on an empty list. Okay? Uh, otherwise, we match head and tail, apply the predicate to the head, and end the result with a recursive call to the tail. So if this is false, the rest will not be evaluated. If it's true, then you apply it recursively until you either get um, false or you hit this case when you you return true. So this is a translate. This is a little bit more code, so it doesn't fit on one slide in C++. Uh, first, the declaration, right? So it. So what what is a function there? You know the predicate. This function <coughs> has to be a compile time function. A compile time function is a template, right? So it's a template. Template. It's called template template parameter, right? So this is my function here, the predicate. Okay, and this is the list. <coughs> okay. And now I have the first specialization of this template is when I only have the predicate, no list, no other arguments. So that's an empty list thing, and it returns true. Right. And the second specialization, that's the same Haskell code, so we can do it. Um, the second specialization is head and tail, pattern matching the list with head and tail. And what I do here is I apply the predicate to the head, right? It's a template, temp it's a template, so you can instantiate it with some type, right? So I'm instantiating this predicate with a type, and, and it returns um, a boolean. Returns in the sense that the value is boolean. So, excuse me, Marcos, so not any type, a type that must contain a boolean Remember, called value. <coughs> um, yeah, yeah, pr yes, yeah it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a meta function. Yeah. And meta function is defined in this way that it ha must have a number called value. Right. And that's like the return, what, what it returns, right? It's called value. <coughs> right. So this is this is something that's built on top of C++. You know, you have you have this convention. Okay, yeah. this is what I'm going to call my meta functions. They have a member called value, or you know, in some other um, 
applications, if you're not returning a, a value, but you're returning another type, then you call it type. Call it, call it type. So I have this value, the boolean, the return by the predicate, and um, and I end it with the recursive code. <coughs> recursive code. That works very nicely, okay? So I'm using here variadic templates as lists, right? Yes? This is just a quick question, but do you know if this would short circuit at compile time if the predicate was false? You said no, it doesn't. No. 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 Okay. No, it doesn't. No. But there is a way of lazily evaluating stuff, right? That's what MPL does. It's true. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So there are tricks. There are tricks. You can implement the optimization by hand, basically. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now in Haskell, this is never a problem because Haskell is a lazy language, so it will never evaluate anything that's not needed. But here's the next problem, okay? I want to implement the map algorithm. Map is what at runtime STL uh, calls transform. So you take your list and you apply a function to every element of the list and you get a new list. Okay, I wrote it in a funny notation here. In, in Haskell you can write it this way. It's called a list comprehension. And it's based on mathematical notation. So map takes a function that operates on elements of the list and the list. And it returns a new list that contains elements fx, f acting on x. Again, no parentheses in, in Haskell when you call a function. But this is a function <coughs> called with argument x. And this means where x comes from the list. So the list generates these elements, x's, and f is applied to these x's, and the return is, is a list of these elements, these new, these new elements. So it makes a new copy of the list where all, all the elements are... Uh, um, apply a function. Yeah. Apply a function. Yeah. So, so this would be the, uh, a trivial kind of first attempt at translation. Hey, we know how to translate these things, right? So, so f is, is a template template argument, no problem. We okay. have a list here. And actually, the funny thing is that um, uh, parameter parts and variadic templates, they actually have a syntax of list comprehension. This thing here is actually a list comprehension, right? Because you say dot, dot, dot here, and it will expand list here. But it will expand element by element. So the f will be called by with the first element, then it will be called the, by the second element, and third element, and so on. So this is really C++ notation for list comprehension. Okay? This is something that has to be understood they explain it, but, but you know, once you know Haskell, you know that this is the main comprehension. So that should work, <coughs> right? But it doesn't compile. It doesn't compile because this parameter pack thing here is not a first class citizen in C++. This is where C++ kind of abandoned the theory and just went for, you know, oh, we just want to solve the problem of print. Right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so print it. Who cares? <laughs> no. 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 If you read the paper, he want Yeah, if you read the paper, he wanted no. to make first class parameter packs and there was a reason, there's a technical reason that it didn't work out. And nobody okay. can solve that technical problem. So. Okay, I am exactly right. <laughs> what is that? No, that was Doug, right? <coughs> yeah. no, Doug is a very smart guy, and, and, and he knows the theory. Okay? If he couldn't do it, it means that it just doesn't fit into C++ very well. It's not his fault, it's C++. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. I'm serious. Doug is a great guy. Um, 
so this doesn't work. And then I thought, okay, uh, why don't we do something really complex to make it work? Yes? Yeah. Can't, can't you just like wrap that um, part in like a STD tuple? Right, right. You could wrap it, but how do you get it out? I mean, <laughs> okay, so, so yeah, that, that's, that's one of the solutions. You want to return this. And the, the problem with this is it doesn't compose. Because if you have a bunch of algorithms like math, right? Yeah. The first one will return you not a parameter path, but it will return you some new thing like the type list, yeah. right? Do some specialization and then you would have to unpack this type list, make it into a variadic template to call another of this type yes. of arguments and so on. <laughs> so bad. composition. It doesn't sound too not bad. so bad. It's just an extra specialization. But what you've done already is does, is not a direct mapping onto the Haskell because your list is not a single argument to your meta function. Your list is is all of the arguments to the meta function <coughs> after the first one. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't even write a meta function this way that took two lists, right? If you wanted to. No. So no, we talked about it with, with Eric. Can you take actually two uh, parameter paths uh, for arguments? And, and, and the, the way to do this, okay, this clever way of doing this is that you, you define a template which inside has another template. So like do this with this, right? Where with is a template inside the template. Or currying. But, but basically it's currying. Yeah. Currying, exactly, it's currying. But, but the easier solution would be just if, if you have, if you want to have, make a meta function that takes two mm -hmm. lists, you could just... No, I know what the easy yeah. solution is, okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, this is why Eric said this is doesn't lead anywhere, and he refused to. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's right. Uh, okay. I mean, yes. The easy way to do this is before you start even any calculation, start first take, turn your variadic arguments into a type list, and do all the calculations using type list, and they compose nicely. Okay, and that's the solution. One thing this is really good for, though, is, is showing the inherent limitations mm -hmm. of uh, variadic parameter packs. They are not first-class things, and it, uh, it means that there are some things in C++ that you just can't do. Right. But I'm a stubborn guy. <laughs> 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 and I thought, oh, there must be a way of doing it, because, you know, there's, there's functional programming. So, so I thought, okay, so I cannot pass I cannot return it, but let me think a bigger picture, right? You cannot return it, but um, your program is doing something with this <coughs> list. Your goal is not to just return the list. It's to return a list and then do something with it. And eventually your, your result will be something else, not a list. So eventually you'll convert it into something else. So there is this part that operates on list and is supposed to return a list, and there is the rest of your program. And this rest of your program, instead of calling it with the parameter part returned from, from the previous calculation, why don't I just say this rest of the program is my lambda, right? I call it a continuation, right? And I pass the continuation as an argument to my, to my algorithm. So my algorithm actually does the calculation and then calls the continuation with whatever it calculates. And this actually works. Okay? It's complicated and unnecessary, but it works. Okay? <laughs> so here, here's this thing implemented in, in Haskell when you define this new function, map continuation, that takes three arguments instead of two, okay? So the first argument here is the continuation, which is a function. Do this after you're done with your algorithm, right? There, and then there's the function and the list from the previous one. So what you do is you do your stuff <coughs> with the uh, map, the usual map, and then you pass this list as an argument to the continuation. 
So this is again, call a function with this argument, but no parentheses in Pascal. But that's how you look at it. And this is the same code, and it's not even so much code, right? It's just hard to understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's that, it does the same, you know. You, you, you take this continuation, and in this case it's a template, template parameter, which expects a variadic argument, right? And I'm going to pass this variadic argument to it. So I'm going to call a continuation with <coughs> f acting on my list. And here's, here's my dot, 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 which does So this is a s oh, oh okay okay so the next thing that I was going to do and, and Larry told me not to is <laughs> is, is uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the problem is composability. So this is what what, what I told you. You know that, that it's really hard to compose these things um, with using variadic template. It's also hard, and I might say probably even harder to compose the continuation things, right? Because if you want to do the map twice, then okay. But now map takes a continuation, so you have to pass a continuation that will do the second map and call the outer continuation with its result, okay? I can, I can talk about this because I like, thought about this for days, right? So I can now imagine this, but I understand that this is something that's, that's really <coughs> mind-boggling, right? And if this is not enough, the way to compose these things so this is explicit code, code that composes these two things. But it's, you don't want to write special code when, whenever you want to compose two algorithms that operate on variadic templates, right? You would like to have some mechanism that's more abstract to this, that says, okay, this is one algorithm, this is another algorithm, they, they are continuation algorithms, right? Bind them. And this can be done if you introduce the monad, continuation monad, right? Continuation monad, which, which tell you how to compose these continuations once and for all, so you don't have to write special code like this. But of course, when you use continuation monad in uh, C++, the things look even more complicated. <laughs> so at this point, I will stop this. <laughs> <laughs> save you some time. But I'm not done with continuation monad because then I thought, you know, I want to use continuation monad in this gray area and I actually have practical use for it in asynchronous input output. Okay? So asynchronous programming with a continuation monad. So first, I have to define the, what I mean by this continuation monad, okay? And I know this is not an easy thing, uh, especially if you never heard of monads. <coughs> I think most of you did, so it's not so bad. Continuation monads may be a little harder than other types of monads. So I'm, s I'm sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> A monad consists of three things, essentially. One is a type, your, your new type that, that you are introducing. Um, actually, it's a type constructor, but uh, it's a type. This is the type you want to do operations on. And two functions. One is called return, and the other is called bind. Okay, so I'll go through steps. Uh, first, let's define the data type. So the data type is, I, I call it continuator. Okay? 
It's a, it's a data type. This is, this is Haskell. So I'm defining a new type, continuator, that takes two type parameters. R is the type for return value, and A is the type that is free parameter of my data type. So I can, I can have a continuator for booleans. I can have a continuator for integers. I can have a continuator for trees and so on. So this abstracts away what type I'm using internally. And the continuator is just encapsulates, this is called a constructor, data constructor, or value constructor, encapsulates something that's a function. So this is a Haskell's notation for functions. Okay, so uh, and I'll just translate it. It's a function that takes a function as an argument. And this argument is the continuation I'm talking about. Okay. And calls this continuation and returns the result. So a continuator is something that knows how to produce a value, but it doesn't return this value. Instead, if you call it with a continuation, it will call this continuation with that value. How it gets this value is internal implementation of this continuator. Okay, there are continuators that do booleans, there are continuators that do integers, and so on. But they all work in the same way. Give me a continuation, and I'll call your continuation with my value. Okay? And this is where, where the compile time, runtime duality in C comes in. Could you finish narrating the Haskell, please? Yeah. I, I think you only went through the first line. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. So, so you have a. Uh, so, this is an auxiliary function that uh, shows me how to use my continuators. I have a continuator, and what I want to do th with it is eventually call it with a continuation. So there's a function run continuator, right? And it takes a continuator and a continuation. Continuations are often, <coughs> they often use the letter K for continuation. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so um, a continuator just encapsulates some function, we call this action inside the continuator, right? Uh, and I just want to call this, this, this function with a continuator. So this, this is the function that takes a function and returns some value. And this is a function that takes a continuation and then returns some value. So I'm just applying my continuator. Once I'm given a continuation, I can apply my continuator to it. Okay? And it will call the continuator with whatever value it produces. So, so this is the implementation in C++ of the same idea. So it's parameterized by two types. And we'll, we'll sort of get rid of this result type eventually, because it really doesn't matter. Um, this is the important parameter. So continuator is a struct that has a member function, run continuator. So this, so imagine that your continuations are not available at compile time. Your continuations are available at runtime. So you pass it, you pass to it real function. That's my continuation. And now, please, continuator, do your job with this function at runtime. So the stuff that happens at compile time will deal with how do you combine these continuators into something more complex, something that will do some useful work. So you start with some very simple continuators. You define your simple continuators. And then you bind them together to create more complex calculation, computation. Right? But this is the basis. This is the basis. So my continuator will always be a structure that has a member function. 
and this member function is called with a continuation. Now I'm using standard function um, because that's easier to implement. Uh, well, on the other hand, it's not as optimizable as lambda. You could have expressed it as a separate template parameter. Exactly. But that leads to further complications and makes, makes the code less and less readable. Well, one of the problems with lambdas, when you try using lambdas, is that you can't actually return a lambda from the function. So yeah. the operation is tight. Right. Um, so you, you end up with a std function. You end up with a std function. Yeah. <coughs> so I just gave up on it and went straight to the std function. So Amona defines two special functions. One is, one is called return and the other is called bind. Return is a very simple function. It just takes any value <coughs> and makes a continuator out of it. Okay? So that's, that's very simple to, to implement. <coughs> so you want to uh, generate the function. Yes? Um, I'm a little confused by it because you, you showed the declaration for one continuator mm -hmm. inside of the continuator class, but you never showed a definition for it. Am I missing no, it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like an interface or a concept? Okay. This is a concept. Yes. Yeah. This, this should be a concept. And I was never actually going to use this, I was, I was but I'm creating it. hand right. creating, you know, manufacture of continuators. Yeah. But this is the concept. Yeah, you said it was a privilege. Yeah, yeah, okay. You're right. So, so uh, return is a special function, and no, don't confuse it with C++ return. It's a special function that uh, encapsulates a value. So I pass it a value, and it returns me a continuator. How do I create a continuator? Well, I have to have a function, right? So I'm defining this function. It's a very simple function. Give me a continuation, and I will your, call your continuation with x. So I have a boolean, or I have an integer, or something, and I want to turn it into a continuator. That's very easy. Just have a lambda that takes a con continuation and calls this continuation with whatever I have, a boolean or integer. <coughs> And in the language of C++, uh, return is just an object, a struct, <coughs> that has a method run, con, run continuation. Right? So what it does is, when you construct this return object, you pass it the value of type t. t is a parameter. So it could be a boolean, it could be an integer, it could be a tree, anything. And it stores it here as a... As a variable, and then when you call run continuation, you pass it the continuation, it will call this continuation with this value. So this is exactly the same stuff as happens in Haskell with some more. Would it, you, sorry, just a clarification, you, you could have expressed it as a lambda, which you would have stored into a std function and call it return, right? That could have worked. Instead of making it a Yes. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. In fact, I think I, I, I had some kind of implementation of from the previous year that actually used lambdas purely without any structs. Struct is here a functional <coughs> object, right? This is a functional object. And, right. and lambda is a functional object. So we would have to capture x. It is the function. Yeah. Okay. It would capture x and, and use it. So the second part of the monad, uh, or third actually, is, is the bind function. This is a little bit more complicated, and I probably shouldn't go into too much detail of it. But the idea is that you have a continuator, and you have the rest of your calculation. And you want to combine these two. So you want to do something that will evaluate your continuator, given continuation, evaluate your continuator, then call the rest of your program, and the rest of your program is also returning a new continuator. Okay? 
I know this is this is the, a lot to take in one. So bind takes a continuator as an argument <coughs> and a function that represents the rest of the calculation, right? And it has the method run continuator, <coughs> which creates this lambda here. This is the lambda, but here the lambda will be uh, a function. And, and the void here stands for this return type, which I just fixed to be void. I'm not interested in the final return. So that's it. And I'm not going to go into detail because that would take too much time. <clears throat> but the idea is that's, that's the way of combining continuators. Okay? A very generic code that combines continuators. <clears throat> and now let's apply this stuff to a synchronous API. So this is my, my toy asynchronous call. What it does is, uh, an asynchronous call takes a hand, handler, right? So do something uh, that takes a long time, and eventually call the handler when you have the result. Like read a file, and then call a handler that can operate on the contents of this file. Whatever you read, give it to me, and I'll operate. So this is a, a, a <coughs> generic API, takes a handler, and it will call this handler at some point. But um, it's asynchronous. So what it does here is um, it creates a thread. It captures the handler, creates a thread, and this, this thread does, OK, it does some output, say it started async, and then goes to sleep for three seconds. That's my imitation of, you know, having to read file or work, waiting for network um, input or something like that, right? And, and then it, once, once it finishes with this, it calls the handler. And in this case, it calls the handler with a string done async. So done async is supposed to be the result of my asynchronous call. Okay? But async API returns immediately, right? Um, almost immediately. It just creates a thread, detaches this thread, and comes back. Right? That's like a, an async call. You call it, it, it returns almost immediately. What will happen when it finishes, okay, it will call the handler. <coughs> so already you see that this is like handler is like a continuation, right? Do some, something and then call my continuation with whatever you got. So I want to encapsulate it into my generic uh, continuator. So the continuator for this particular call would be, you know, let's call it async API. That's, that's my continuator. And it has run continuation. And it just calls async API with the continuation. So the continuation will be my handler. Okay? And now how do I combine these things? Okay, because I want to combine them with some real code. And the most, <coughs> maybe, maybe not the most, but, but the interesting case is when you have to call several continuators and each depends on the result from the previous one. And this is even more complex case in which you want to call the same continuator in a loop. So, so you say, okay, I'm calling the API, it re returns the result, I, use some, I do something with this result, and then I look back, call the API, with this new result that I calculated. And it does its own job, returns some result, and I do something with this result, and go back to the loop. So I'm looping possibly infinitely, you know, just taking these asynchronous calls. The, uh, well, there are two ways of implementing it, synchronous and asynchronous. 
Synchronous, it's just a loop. You call the API, you do something, you go back to the beginning of the loop. Now, a synchronous implementation of the same thing would require you to split this call into do something, and when you're done, call the handler. And you put the handler in separate function. Okay? Now you are disjoint. Your code that looked very nicely when you used a synchronous call, right? It used sequential. It looked sequential. Now suddenly it is split into two places. Here's my call. Here's the handler. Now if I want to do the looping, then this handler would have to call back my call. Right? And when this finishes, it will call the handler back. And the handler will do something and call my function again using recursion. And of course you, yeah. Um, so this is the, the implementation uh, in Haskell, the same pattern, right? The same pattern using continuations would be implemented in such a way. Do some work, like print the string, right? Uh, and then call the async, whatever the async returns, call loop again to <coughs> the result of async. So this is a looping concept, but written, by, but writ, written in terms of uh, recursion. Right? Now, now this do notation in Haskell is, is just syntactic sugar, so it looks better. But really what it calls is a calls it bind, right? And my async call is this continuator, right? So I'm combining the continuator with the rest of the code, and the rest of the code is just this lambda that takes the result of the asynchronous call and calls loop. And this is how the stuff is translated into C++. It doesn't look beautiful. But it does the same thing. So you create a loop, <coughs> which is a continuator. Right? So you are creating a higher order continuator based on your lower order atomic uh, continuator. Because async API is another continuator. So this shows you how to build continuators from continuators. And you do, you do this using monadic bind. Okay? So run continuation for the loop just takes this outer continuation, like the one that will be passed to you in the future. It does this work of printing out, so that's this part. And then it creates a bind object, which corresponds to this little thing here. Yes? So if um, you mentioned in the last slide, you're talking about the C sharp continue with. If you have like some future construct that has some ability to say continue with, is that a continuator monad? Mm -hmm. Cool. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. With much nicer notation, I must say. But but this is the theory behind it. Okay. So so you create the bind object that. Um, Call the async API, right? And the rest of the code. The rest of the code here is a C++ lambda that calls the loop. Calls in the sense that it creates a continuator from the loop. No, it's not creating. Sorry, this is the C++ return. Okay, it just calls the loop with whatever S was passed to it. So this, this lambda will be called in the future, right? When, when finally the async API returns. Right? So, so this becomes the handle. The beauty, if you can see beauty through this code, the beauty of it is that you don't separate your handler somewhere outside. You don't split this into two functions. All your code is in one place. Also, when you are splitting your code into function and handler, you suddenly lose connection between these two. So, you, for instance, you cannot use local variables that were there in your original function because the 
handler is a completely new function. In this way, you can actually capture them. Here I'm not capturing anything, but I could capture anything here. Of course, I have to capture it by value, not by reference, mind you. But I can capture stuff. So this code, if you squint hard enough, and, and really have to squint hard, looks almost like synchronous code, right? sequential code. In sequential code, you would call this API without the async, and whatever it did returned a string, and you're calling this loop. And this is what C sharp does. It, C sharp has, you know, you call async API and it returns a future. And now on this future, you call this continue with and you pass it a lambda. So that's a different notation, much <coughs> nicer notation for the same thing. Now what C sharp did is they went even further and they provided the syntactic sugar for it called await. So you don't even have to say um, continue with, you just say await for this async API and the rest of the function becomes the continuation automatically. So there's a transformation done by the compiler which takes the rest of your function, turns it into a continuation. Yes? Does the C sharp continue with return the, the equivalent of a future so that you can yes. continue with on it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. They figured <coughs> out the way of composing these right. things. Unlike C++ futures, which right. are totally uncomposable, they compose everything. So, so async API will return a future. Continue with will return another future. You can then combine them using wait for all or right, right? or any. Yeah. Um, OK, yeah. Uh, let me see. Is this is the end? Uh, oh, no. I, I actually ran this program. <laughs> <laughs> So it's not here, it's, it, it works in practice. Uh, so this is the main program. I create this loop object, right? my continuator, my complex continuator. I initialize it with a string loop. And I say run continuation. And I pass it in, in the outer continuation. This is the ultimate continuation that will be called. And this outer continuation just prints the string. Okay? And it returns void. Uh, but once I create this object, you know, this object will call the async API and, and, and loop forever, calling async API. Uh, but this, this is just a constructor of an object, so it returns immediately, right? And then I go into this loop, which just prints i from 0 to 200 every second. And this is the output of this program. See, so zero comes from this <coughs> loop. It prints zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's the main during this loop. In the meanwhile, this async loop is running, creating separate threads, right? And it prints from time every three seconds. It does start, started async, waits three seconds, done async, started async, three seconds, done async and so on, and adding things. And the interesting thing is that although it looks like recursion, right? And the original stuff looks like recursion, and if you did it synchronously, it would really be recursion. It's not. So you don't blow your stuff. This actually can go on forever. Okay? Okay, Eric, it's your turn. You have all questions. Okay, just for the rule, the rule started a new thread every two seconds, right? It will start a new thread every two seconds. It will do that forever. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Yeah. Fifteen. <laughs> all right. I'll have to go quick. Let's switch. Uh, let's switch people. I had many more slides, but I just <laughs> <laughs> that's enough. Okay. So um, 
when Bartosz and I started uh, scoping this out, um, we started decided we wanted to talk about uh, variadic templates, and that led him to continuations, and it led me to pursue some uh, very, I guess, kind of pedestrian practical problems with the use of variadic templates. Um, and uh, that's what I'm going to share with you today. In particular, uh, uh, the runtime, uh, compile time problems, and compile time uh, problems that come up with um, tuples. Okay, so I'm going to skip over this. This is like a motivation slide. Like, I'm interested about tuples because I wrote the Boost Proto library, which is basically tuples of tuples of tuples. It creates trees. Um, okay. Consider this discussion suitably motiv motivated. <laughs> um, okay, so here's what I did. I decided to write a program um, that created like a really big tree of tuples within tuples. And I wanted to find out uh, how it performed at compile time. What I was thinking was that uh, I have my suspicions about the compile time performance of variadic templates, and I thought, I bet that the non-variadic tuple would perform better at compile time than the variadic tuple. So I tried uh, to run this benchmark against uh, GCC 4.1, and uh, which has a non-variadic tuple implementation, versus GCC uh, 4.7, which has a variadic one. And I was uh, sorely disappointed to find out that um, progress has been made in the world since uh, <laughs> GCC 4.1 came out, and uh, variadic tuple performs terrific at compile time. Um, uh, yeah. So, so say it? <laughs> yeah, the there's, there's an obvious problem with this. Yes. The yes. Uh, template instantiation specialization lookup algorithm of GCC. Totally, one totally one different, system. right? So I've measured the wrong thing. Right. Yeah. Um, so then I thought, ah, let me try a better test. I'm going to take the non variadic tuple implementation from GCC 4.1 and nuke the uh, variadic one and just overwrite it with the non variadic one. And any ideas uh, what the result of the next graph will be? <coughs> Who thinks that uh, variadic templates, the way of the future, are faster? <laughs> one person. That's not the case. Everybody else is right, you're wrong, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay, so here is GCC 4.7. And here's GCC 4.7 with a TR1 style tuple that does not use variadic templates. Is anybody surprised by this? I'm a little surprised. You're a little surprised by this? Have you done this test with planning? I have not. I've only done it with GCC. Okay. But, um, yeah. so, so I'm going to get into why. Uh, so, so we're going to look at uh, how tuples are implemented. Okay, this is a TR1 style tuple. It can have any number of parameters as you want, as long as it's like less than 10 or so. <laughs> so here's how tuple is implemented with no parameters. It's pretty simple. Here's how it's implemented when it has exactly one element in it. And it's, you know, a whole lot of code repetition. Maybe this is generated with the preprocessor or whatever. Okay. So, pretty simple. Um, basic. Any questions about that? Yeah. I don't think boost tuple did that way. I think boost tuple actually did implemented the non-variadic tuple the way a variadic tuple is implemented with deriving from the version that passes one last time. It, it can't actually because here's the um, the forward signature, uh, the declaration yeah, of, of it tuple. Just used some special marker and a not available type. And inside. Yeah. Inside. So that's basically how fusion vector is implemented. Yes. Um, boost tuple is implemented using a const list. Okay, but, but there's still there's this this yeah. outer wrapper, right? Yeah. Where you specify a, a certain number of parameters, right? Yeah. And that can only go up to a certain fixed number. You know, maybe behind the scenes, if you wanted to drop down and actually use cons lists directly, um, they. Uh, what did your benchmark actually do? With this? Tree. So it built, it built a tree uh, of um, so of a certain branching factor. I picked ten, and then of uh, different depths. And built how? Built uh, using a recursive template instantiation, and then it called uh, get on every member of every element in the tree. So also measuring the performance to compile all the get invocations. 
Okay. Uh, it's, it's hard to tell what computation you're measuring there, but because you didn't describe the, the building process very right. carefully. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to blast through this. Um, I, I didn't realize the screen was going to be quite this small. I'm sorry if you have a hard time seeing this. <laughs> but this is a, a C11 tuple, and this is kind of cleverly implemented, and I got best practice from Doug Dredger and Howard Hinnant. Uh, you have this struct called tuple ellen that holds an element for a tuple. And it also has uh, an, an integer here, uh, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, then we have tuple impl, which takes a, this is going to be a list of integers, and a variable parameter list of types. And here's its specialization. So we're going to have like a pack of integers and a pack of types. And we're going to inherit from tuple element, expanding both of those packs in lockstep. Okay. So tuple impl is going to inherit from tuple element 0 int, tuple element 1 char, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is just a constructor um, that forwards everything. And here's how tuple is implemented. It just derives from tuple impl. Um, and I haven't shown you what indices is, but it, it generates this uh, list of integers. All right. So why does tuple alone <coughs> have an integer? And so you can trivial, trivially implement the get member function. If you call get and you pass it a tuple, well, that's implicitly convertible to tuple lm0, tuple lm1, tuple lm2. So if I say, get me the second element, I use the implicit conversion to tuple lm2 and can jump straight to that particular element in my tuple. OK, clever. So this is basically how uh, tuples are implemented in C11. Can anybody see why? This implementation compiles slower than the one on the previous slide. Steve. So when you're doing overload resolution, you have to check through all the bases. Well, if you have the straight version, you can just look up the name, which is going to go through some kind of hash table, probably. Um, possibly. And to be honest, I'm not 100% certain why, but I have my guess, and that's not it. Um, it's, you're thinking the instantiation of the base classes. Right, right. So that's my theory. Um, this guy right here. Yeah. So for every tuple, we're going to uh, instantiate uh, n uh, tuple elm classes. OK, that's going to be slow. Yeah. Not to mention the indices. They get repeated. So yeah, they get repeated, so you can you know, disregard that. OK, so here's, here's the problem. In C11, a tuple of n elements requires order n template instantiations, and there's no real way around it. Um, question? Well, so years ago, Alex needed a, a tuple that held several hundred <coughs> types, and you know, this is typical head tail just blew the compiler out. Yeah. So I ended up writing a type of implementation, which I've got somewhere. That uh, constructs the tuple itself and the tree. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which greatly limits the, the amount of recursion. Right, that would be great. However, yeah. uh, you can't do that with variadic templates, and I'm going to get into why. Okay. Um, what, what you can do with variadic templates is that you hand roll those same, same first. Uh, Ones like like in C plus plus O three, and then just use the tail of that list so you don't. Cool. Have you want to get up here and the rest of my talk? <laughs> 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 However, uh, that is still order n. You're just bringing yeah. down the constant factor. Yeah. Okay. So so here's the ugly truth about variadics. There's no random access into a parameter pack, which is why you can't do yeah. what you did. Yeah. Okay. You can only access the first element or the first two elements or the first three elements, right? Uh, and also, you can't store a parameter pack as a data member, and this is a real gotcha. Like, it would be great if tuple could be implemented as, okay, here's my parameter pack, and now I have like a data member that stores all of them. Right. No, 
can't do that. For the same reason that you can't return from a meta function uh, a, a parameter back. Because they're not first class thingies. They are thingies. <laughs> they're, they're things. We don't know what, oh, I don't know what kind of a thingy it is, but it, it doesn't fit into the type system very well. Second class, obviously. Second class. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Multi-class <laughs> type system. So, so the hybrid approach, yeah, uh, preprocessor to handle up to n elements, refers to handle the next n, still order n, but hopefully it will be better. Um, so this implementation should look familiar. This is just like, um, Expanding out like the first n elements using the tr1 tuple impl like implementation, and now here's the ugly bit where we recurse. Okay, so here my specialization has so here I'm only expanding <coughs> three elements. Okay, zero, one, and two, and here we have a parameter pack that represents the rest of the tuple. Okay. So here's my first three elements. Okay, here's the rest of the tuple. I have a tuple inside a tuple. You know. Yeah that stores the tail of the tuple, all right? And a constructor that does all the nasty bulky. So that's the recursion. Now, I'm gonna skip this. This is how to implement get on one of these things, and it's really nasty. Um, one thing I will point out here is, because uh, it's gonna show up on your slides. I use, um, you know, this macro, forgive me. Um, for return, it uses the decal type, and it's for when, yeah, okay. You looked up the no accept part, the, the whole no accept part. The, for yeah, the I know, there's a huge ugly no accept part, but I didn't <coughs> want to get into it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, that's going to make it much, much simpler uh, and avoid code repetition when I define uh, functions. Okay, so here's the result. <coughs> that looks pretty great. So, variadic tuple, tr1 tuple, and this preprocessor unrolled tuple. We've brought the compile times back to where they were. Okay, more of this. Um, okay, so I don't want to have to jump through those hoops ever again. That's disgusting. Um, not only that, it doesn't really solve the problem because it's still order, it, still order n. So I started to brainstorm like, okay, what would a better solution for C++11? Something that gave me random access so I could use the trick that Sean describes. Um, and I thought, well, geez, wouldn't it be great if these things were first-class thingies and if they actually fit into the type system? So here, what if I don't expand the parameter path? What happens? Well, in C++11, that's an error. This code doesn't apply. <coughs> it would be cool if the compiler could just turn that into some sort of tuple-like thing, because that's basically what it is, really. But it's some sort of built-in tuple. So I could define std tuple as inheriting from one of those things. Cool. Okay. And then the compiler would also have to overload a bunch of std get calls so I could have random access into it. Right. So parameter packs are first class objects now. You could store them in variables. You could return them from functions. Okay. Now, if you store one in a variable, it automatically becomes a tuple-like thingy. But maybe you'd still want to be able to expand it. Now, you have like a tuple-like thing in one variable, and you could expand it into multiple variables. That'd be cool. Now, why don't we just let all structs be expandable? Well, you could do that too, right? So you could, <laughs> you could define a pack expansion operator on any arbitrary stuff. So for instance, std tuple, you'd want to be able to expand just like a built-in tuple. <coughs> That'd be kind of cool. So if you have multiple such things, how do you decide which ones that you want to expand? Right, so you can, indir you can indirect through uh, a, a function or a template uh, to, uh, if, you, if you expand the parameter pack in a context where it is then collapsed again, you can have fine-grained control over what things get expanded with. I'm not going to get into it, but I've thought about that. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I've talked about this with some other people, and they were like, that's a crazy idea, and it will never, ever work. Um, <laughs> uh, we've been down this road. Um, so uh, uh, this guy, Richard Smith, this client developer, uh, he has his own ideas about how this is, uh, should work. 
Um, and he wants to actually implement this, uh, which is not my idea, uh, so I don't fully crock it. And he only sent it to me a few days ago. Um, so his idea is to allow expanded pack expressions to be members. That is, don't implicitly convert to a built-in <coughs> tuple thing. Don't try to make these things first-class things, because they're not really. Um, so here you have values, which is an expanded parameter pack that you know, stores all the values of the tuple. And then you have this get impl, but it's defined very strangely with the dot dot dot. Okay. And what this generates is actually a series of get impls. Uh, he also added another <coughs> extension. I know, I know, this is crazy. Yeah. Another, another extension where you can say zero dot 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 and another integer, which expands to zero, one, two, three, four, up to n. Okay. This function is actually a collection of functions for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So it's, your idea it's, basically <laughs> <laughs> it's basically a pack expansion on a complete function. Sure, yes. Okay. Um, and here's how get would be implemented. Uh, right, so if you say get me the nth element, it, call, it invokes like NPL size t of n, so it would call the nth get impl, which would pull back the uh, Correct value, presumably. Well, yeah. just something there. You, you, right now, you can use the expansion on lambda expressions, so you can kind of do something that is equivalent-ish to expanding a function. Mm -hmm. but it's just you can only do it on lambdas. Yeah, but you couldn't define member functions. Though. Sure. Yeah. Just, just be lambdas. But yeah. That, that, that exists. It only works on the counter list. Um, I don't actually know that. No, it's not just the capture list. I, 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 at least, at least, I'm not sure if it's like standard compliant, but at least GCC and Quinn support this. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. and, and I haven't seen anything that indicates that it's not standard compliant. All right. So, uh, so he also wants an overloadable prefix operator dot dot dot. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, so simple. Oh, but yeah. What I like about his proposal. <laughs> but the problem he's trying to solve with it is um, if, if, you, if you didn't have this dot 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 here, you just said wrap my tuple dot dot dot. Uh, the question then is uh, am I expanding my tuple or am I repeating a bunch of uh, invocations of wrap? on individual elements of the tuple, or on the whole tuple. Okay. This explicitly says, do the expansion, okay, and expand wrap also. So uh, wrap is called multiple times with uh, all of the parameters uh, of the tuple. And he's thinking about implementing this? Yeah, he wants to implement it, yeah. yeah. Oh no, I got that wrong. I got that wrong. It expands to this code. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Because that's just expanding on the new app, but you also expand or it makes sense. Because if you just right. wanted to expand my tuple in a way, then it would be just post fix dot dot dot. Right, right, right. Okay. Oh, sorry. So, so that's how he's calling them. He's he's dollar zero, dollar one. I don't know if he's going to. This is all in his call, head. You gotta name it something. That's yeah. like my biggest problem. How, what do you call this thing? <coughs> no clue. Just yeah. the just yeah. an idea. I should be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So during the development of C++ 98, um, we discussed periodic templates. And at the time, we had exactly that notation for um, for basically being able to make a variadic struct that had members with the mm -hmm. types of a variadic template. We also had a notation that was um, member access, so dot or arrow. And then square bracket and index, and you could access your members by index. Yeah. And no, you had no access access um, checking. No. It would obviously have to be a compile time entry. Right. Uh, would that be enough? To um, them? that's a good question. Um, I think there might be some sort of like um, uh, 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 parsing problem with that, because you might not know, like just like you have like the dot template abomination. Um, it's, it's hard to say, for me to say, it's, I'm not a compiling dev, you would know better than I would, Dave, um, whether or not that would lead to parsing ambiguities. 
Well, no, that's Ind true. Independent I, I, think, I think we worked it out back then. You know, yeah. like it worked. Possibly there was some additional ugliness, but you'd have those two operations. Okay, yeah. I, th I think it's probably equivalent. Um, sounds that way to me. It sounds simpler than <laughs> this stuff. Yes, yeah, so this sounds very complicated. Um, I like my idea better, but various people like um, Doug Gregor have assured me that he, he thought about it and it, it, it runs into problems. Yeah. Oh. Well, I think the problem, if I remember right, the problem is the one that Stephen mentioned, is, which is which is how do you know which thing you're expanding. Um, but if you have an answer for that, then yeah. maybe it's maybe it's not problem. Yeah, question. Yeah. Well, the point of it, uh, well, first of all, it's fun, fun to see how you ended up with the same problems as I have during last year. But for the point of it, I, I implemented as a library solution uh, the calling of any functions when, when a tuple is expanded as arguments mm, yeah. for it. Of course, the simple case is when you have just one tuple and that makes the arguments for the function, and I think it's already in boost. boost uh, yeah, yeah, like uh, Fusion has yeah, uh, yeah. invoke, that sort of thing. But I, I went a step further and, and implemented a solution where I call uh, apply function, uh, and then list of arguments where each of those can be uh, tuples, and if I want to expand those tuples, I add a star <coughs> of those, and they will expand in place. So oh, I, can, okay. I, can, I can call like, 17 argument function by passing five, five, five like <laughs> two, two. Yes, it's, it's a Python so inspired syntax. Yeah, right? like in Python. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Uh, but yeah, but but uh, the other thing that I think would fit in this proposal, and I, I like your idea better <laughs> in this case as well, uh, that I think is not not met here yet, is that uh, it would be beneficial to be able to uh, catch uh, arguments from a function, so use uh, the ellipsis for auto. So if a function returns, yeah. let's say, two values, min and max, for instance, that I could, I could get the value and the types for the x and y for the min and max in place instead of having to okay. type so, the so, so being able to return yeah. multiple things. Yeah. OK. That's not uh, what I was suggesting. What I was suggesting uh, is you actually end up returning one thing, and it's a type built into it. So you yeah. still have to unpack it. Yeah. But that's, that's one thing that, that is not possible to do. And one, one example where you, that might be beneficial would be the range based, based for, uh, for a collection that returns in indices and mm -hmm. items, for instance. You okay. can't cool. by overloading the comma for you. <laughs> <laughs> Still have to build an object. Yeah. Uh, although, um, I'm not sure I see the difference. All right. Well, I think that's the end of it. Um, very X rule, uh, there's some artificial limitations, um, and it's difficult to work around them without incurring like heavy compile time uh, penalty. Um, and some simple language extensions that uh, some people, including myself, have been thinking about could uh, solve the problem for the next version of standard. So, your original problem is a narrow problem of compile time. Um, I mean, can't this be just solved by a better compiler. <laughs> so compiler is yeah. optimizer during compilation. No, it's yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the problem is is more fundamental than that. It's like the std distance given uh, uh, random access iterators versus std distance given forward um, iterators. There's algorithmic difference between those two. And as long as variadics are only forward sequences, you're going to have algorithmic problems with compilation time that you wouldn't have if they were random access. But let me try to address this in a slightly different way. Um, what, what a compiler would have to do in order to optimize that stuff, I, I agree with you, in principle it's optimizable, right? Mm -hmm. But in order to optimize it, the compiler would have to recognize these patterns that are, that are what we call compile time computation and it calls some template expansion. And it would have to recognize those as compile time computation and turn them back into, into something it could do quickly. Yeah. And that, <coughs> we, don't, we don't know anybody who's been willing to make the effort to do that. I don't, I don't know if it's possible. I'm playing with the in the end, in order to make it conform in C++, you have to produce the instantiated template so that later things in the program can access it, you know, even, though, even if it's just acting as a meta function, later things in 
in the program might suddenly decide to use it as a class, pass it as a parameter to a function, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so so you can't get a you can't get away from the need to actually build that internal structure in the compiler at some level, mm -hmm. right? And and instantiation is order dependent, so you can't just do that anywhere. You can't do that later. But isn't so, that the problem of, of the compiler technology that actually instanti does instantiation by creating these humongous strings? Is that no? The problem. The problem. The problem is that we have that we have an alias for for compile time computation that has all of these other this other baggage of meaning. Yeah, but what's the reason why it takes so long? It's got to build real classes. It, the yeah. compiler has a, a representation for these types. So he's talking about like, well, ten to ten depth tuples, and, and they are already well, separated. It's, it's from a lot. You, you yeah. have depth of ten. That's a lot of things. Yeah. A lot of instantiation. So, log in. If you were if you were going after instead of going after constant time, if you just went after log in time, could you have a simpler solution that just provided a split operation that would take an argument back and cut it in half? That's what Dave wants. Well, that's one of the things that I want, but I I, I don't think that I don't think that that should um, I don't I think that we should have what Eric is proposing. And that. I think you can build what you're proposing on top of what I'm. I mean, if you agree with well, yes, access, right, access, you can split. Right, right, right. right. But I'm just thinking that, sure. that, that split might be a <coughs> uh, less intrusive solution. Mm. If you, if you do so. want to run an access on, on variadix, why not slice? Why not slice them too? If you have, let's okay, say, yeah, a syntax, take a tuple yeah. and yeah. bracket 5 to get the fifth element, why not? Bracket two dot dot five to get. Oh come on, let's go with Collins. <laughs> sure. Yeah, sure. Exactly. Yeah. Well, okay. It's I, template, so I'm going with that. <laughs> I, I think but there's there's a, 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 a even higher order way of looking at it. Is yeah. that why are we using functional programming at compile time at all? I mean, there is. D language, for instance, does compile time computation well, arbitrarily complex that don't use functional programming? They, they look more like yeah. inherited. That's so we have that's a we have, uh, uh, context for that. And and it yes. is. And I, I will show, I will show cool. in my little talk yeah. that you can do some pretty pretty amazing kind of gyrations with context, mm -hmm. but there there is a terrible limitation. <laughs> That's the only way. Yeah, there's a terrible limitation where you you're only allowed just, one statement in that thing. No, that's not the that's not the terrible limitation. No? The terrible limitation is the is that the the context for a function has to still be valid if it gets a non-constant argument, mm -hmm. and that means that you can't do things like create a type based on the value you got in. Okay. Right. Because the value might turn out to be a runtime value instead of a compile time. Mm -hmm. <coughs> In D, you can do that. Yeah, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then, we get, then we basically shall get into the area of the W's meta code. So, so W's here, but it's just here. Yes, I'm here. Mm -hmm. But I never understood that total quite. So, meta code. So, I don't, I don't know how to address for the but it's, it's, it's the same as what D does, it's except compile time executable functions. If I, I thought that there were a whole bunch of limitations. I mean, I, I want to be able to use a printf in my. You, you, you have a separate standard library for your compile time. And you could put a printf in there if you want. Okay. Why separate? Because you have a. You know, it's a separate. You have a host and a target compiler, right? And you have a host and a target, so they live. You know, they could be completely different architectures. So a priori, the, the two different implementations. They could be the implementation of similar interfaces, but size t could mean something different on your host and on your target, for example. Okay. All right, we've run a little long. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, and uh, yeah, look for. Uh,